families, especially husband and wife, seeing people in a different light, such as someone saying, whenever I see you, your face looks disfigured, massive changes in personality, which cause harm to the person and those around them, um, and strange behavior, such as refusing to leave the house at certain times and things like this. The difference between magic and possession, both of them involve the jinn. However, possession is the act of one or more of the jinn acting on their own accord. So in jinn possession, the jinn is not being commanded by anyone. He's acting on his own accord. He might be being convinced or being encouraged, but it's his, essentially, he's not being forced. It's his own decision. However, magic is enforced by the magician. The magician is the one who is sending the jinn to afflicted person. Magic is more powerful in a general sense and more difficult to remove except for those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. Now, it's very important that we speak uh, very briefly before we talk about the evil eye, we speak very briefly about the issue of the ta'weef. And that is because many people in our society, many people in our community have been afflicted with the sickness of the ta'weef, getting these amulets that are wrapped around their neck, that the people tell them, this is the Qur'an, this is going to make you better. You know, many of, subhanAllah, you know, I'm not even kidding you, that we would even say that perhaps the majority of them have come from so-called, you know, pious people, or a local imam, or something is giving out of these amulets. And they tell them that this is the Qur'an. It's ayatul kursi. This is what is going to protect you. Of course, hanging the Qur'an around your neck is not going to protect you, and it's not permissible in any case. But we would say, I wish it was the Qur'an. And we've opened, I mean, I don't know, what, what count are we on now? We opened a few hundred, I think. More, the Basak says, more than a few hundred. And I think we can count the ones that were only the Qur'an, maybe on one hand, maximum two hands. The ones that were the Qur'an. The rest of them, full of the names of shaitan. But of course, this miskeen person doesn't know. They read the ta'weed, they see one, two, three, seven, eight, six, two, three, nine. The, the person tells them, this is Allah's greatest name. This was the angel Jibreel came to me in my dream and told me, this is Allah's greatest name. SubhanAllah. And when you decode it using the books of the magicians that are openly available, Google is a great resource. You take the book of the magician, you decode it, it says the name of shaitan, Iblis, Iblis help me, Iblis help me, Iblis help me. And they're telling him it's Allah's greatest name. <laughs> Some of these people don't know what they're doing. Some of the people who give them up are just copying other people. And they're genuinely ignorant. But many of them know what it is that they're doing. And you know, it's not uncommon for people to go to even Hindu priests to get these ta'weed and amulets done. And uh, subhanAllah, this is something that the Prophet وسلم, spoke about that whoever hangs a ta'weev on their neck, whoever hangs a tamima on their neck, an amulet, has committed shirk. And whoever hangs a, a, an amulet on their neck or hangs an amulet around themselves will be entrusted to it. And the Prophet وسلم, said, whoever hangs an amulet, may Allah not, not complete his cure. And so this is something that is extremely severe in Islam. And we advise the brothers and the sisters who have ta'weed, who have amulets at home, give them in, get them destroyed before they end up destroying you. And most of them, when you open them, you will see inside the overwhelming majority are the names of the shaitan. And one of the interesting things is I once opened one and you know, this is like a real shock. I mean, I would actually probably phone Basak at home to tell him, bro, I just opened a ta'weed that was actually Quran. Mm -hmm. It's that rare, you know? So this one was before I think uh, Basak was working with me, that uh, we, I opened the ta'weed that was a printout of the Quran. I mean, it didn't have any numbers, any, it was literally just someone had gone to Quran.com and printed the Quran out. And I said, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, you know, for all it is, it's not allowed for you, but it's the Qur'an. The couple became really angry. They said, they said he charged us X hundred pounds for this. I could have printed this out myself. And this just shows that they knew and the person who gave.
forgive him. They both knew that what they were doing was wrong. And they both knew that they weren't getting the Qur'an. They said to me, what well, likes the Qur'an, the Imam, he's been our father's Imam, and he led the Salah for my grandfather, and all this other stuff. And his family are from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ahlul Bayt, and all of this other stuff, you know. All of this stuff. Open it up. It is just the Qur'an. And they become angry that he cheated us. He cheated us, he was supposed to give us the names of the shaitan and he gave us the Qur'an instead. They knew, they knew and they were simply lying, but they knew fine well that this wasn't from the Qur'an. They knew that this individual, who he was, and they felt cheated that he hadn't committed shirk and he hadn't given them something to disbelieve uh, in Allah As we just conclude uh, very briefly, um, I would like to talk to you very briefly just about the evil eye. And I'm not going to talk to it um, in uh, uh, talk to you about it in a great deal of detail, but just to give you a few points about it. First of all, the evil eye is a kind of illness which some people, and not everyone, are affected with. When they are jealous or amazed of someone, or amazed with someone, instead of just feeling a twinge of jealousy or feeling a feeling of amazement, they actually cause harm to that person. Not everyone who gives the evil eye is jealous, and not every jealous person gives the evil eye. However, I've written on the end of this the word legend, and that is because this is a matter of disagreement amongst the scholars. And the legend at Daima, the permanent scholar, uh, association for the co or committee of senior scholars, they said that Ayn, or that the evil eye only happens through jealousy. And I respectfully disagree with that. And I think that the Sunnah disagrees with it. And that the correct opinion is that it doesn't require jealousy to give the evil eye. Although most people who give the evil eye are jealous. But out of respect for our mashayikh, um, of course not all of our shuyukh agree, but out of a respect for them it's worth mentioning that this is an opinion that is not shared by all scholars. Rather there are a group of scholars who say that the evil eye happens only through jealousy, and a group of them who say that it happens through jealousy and through amazement. However, there is, in my opinion, an overwhelming body of evidence and that those people who deal with Ruqya on a daily basis and those people who study the Ahadith of Ruqya are aware that, it, that there, there is a very strong body of evidence that the evil eye can be given through other than jealousy. So I say from my personal opinion that not everyone who gives the evil eye is jealous and not every jealous person gives the evil eye. <coughs> So not everyone is jealous. You and me might be jealous of someone, and inshallah we wouldn't be. And of course, jealousy means you want the blessing to go away from your brother. You want your brother or your sister to lose that blessing, you want to get it instead. Your brother pulls up in a nice car, you look and you look in the eye and you say, I wish that Allah will take that car away from him and give it to me. And that's the evil of jealousy. In comparison to the one who says, may Allah bless him and bless me with the same. Or may Allah bless him and bless me with better, no problem. But not the one who says, may Allah take it away from him and may Allah give it to me instead. However, when most of us are jealous, the only thing that we destroy are our own deeds. We destroy our own deeds, we wipe our own deeds out. Jealousy eats away at your good deeds like fire eats away at firewood. However, there are some people who when they give the if they are jealous of someone or they are um, uh, particularly amazed and impressed by someone and they don't mention Allah, they don't return the blessing to Allah so again, these people they cause harm to that individual. The Imam Ahmed al Tirmidhi narrated that Asma'ah bin Umais said, Radiallahu anha, O Messenger of Allah, the children of Ja'far have been afflicted by the evil eye, shall we recite a ruqya for them? He said yes. For if anything were to overtake a divine decree, it would be the evil eye. Signs of the evil eye include someone with a praiseworthy attribute being affected in that attribute. Beautiful voice, suddenly can't recite the Quran. Lovely hair, hair suddenly falls out. You know, a youthful look, suddenly it becomes to look really old and, and, and you know, like they're about to die. You know, nice skin, boils develop. You know, that kind of thing. Or, they're afflicted in their whole body and they become very sick very quickly. And you say, what made you sick? You know, they got, they've got this incurable disease just suddenly hit them. What made you sick? They say, I went to a wedding and when I came back from that wedding, I became sick. 
This is when you fear that someone maybe went in front of people, dressed up nicely, looking a good way, maybe people looked at them with an envious eye and caused them some harm. Of course, there are many ways to remove this by saying Tabarakallah, Barakallahu Lek, Allahumma Barik Lahuma, you know, any of these various different statements, may Allah bless you, may Allah, Allah, the blessings come from Allah, all blessings are from Allah, whatever blessings you have are from Allah, but to return the issue of the blessing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is a habit that people should uh, uh, do their best to get into, that when you see something you like, when you see something you're impressed with, when you see something that you are uh, jealous of, that you con you contain this feeling and you return that blessing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, on top of that, uh, that uh, um, you endeavor to learn enough of your religion and especially qadr, a belief in the divine decree, which will help you to overcome these feelings of jealousy. And inshallah, we're going to wrap up there. But after Isha, we're going to continue our talk on Rukia. And I'll talk to you just for five minutes about um, the evil eye and the issue of uh, the wudu and things like that, just to give you an overview. And then we'll talk about Rukia. Okay, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Alhamdulillah, Rajal Alameen, or Salatu Salam, Ala Nabina, Muhammad, and Wala Alihi, or Ashabihi Ajma'in. I think everyone now is more or less aware of this slight change in the program in the sense that we, rather than do a separate talk after Isha, we decided instead, inshaAllah ta'ala, that we would complete the talk on, uh, on Ruqya, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, in order for that to be of the most uh, benefit to people, and in order for us to finish our topic in a way that concludes the subject with those things that can protect you, inshaAllah ta'ala, and the means for your cure. However, we do have some unfinished business to wrap up as it relates to the evil eye. And so we're going to look at the matter of the evil eye in the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Imam Ahmed as well as Imam Malik and Nasai and Ibn Hibban narrate from Sahel Ibn Hanif the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came out and traveled with him towards Mecca until they were in the mountain pass of Al-Kharar and Al-Juhfa and there Sahal ibn Hanif did ghusl and he was a handsome white-skinned man with beautiful skin and Amr ibn Rabi'ah, one of Bani Adi ibn Ka'b looked at him while he was doing ghusl and said I have never seen such beautiful skin as this not even the skin of a virgin and Sahal fell to the ground they went to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then he came and said O messenger of Allah can you do anything for Sahal because by Allah he cannot raise his head he said, do you accuse anyone with regard to him? They said, Amir ibn Rabi'ah looked at him. So the Messenger sallallahu called for Amir and he rebuked him strongly. And he said, why would one of you kill his brother? If you see something that you like, then pray for blessing for him. Then he said to him, wash yourself for him. So he washed his face and hands and forearms and knees and the sides of his feet and inside of his his arm, his lower garment in the vessel, then that water was poured over <coughs> Sahel. A man poured it over his head and his back from behind. He did that to him and then Sahel got up and joined the people as though there was nothing wrong with him. What can we benefit from this hadith? I just want to take you through a few simple points. The first point uh, that we want to take from this hadith is you see the praiseworthy attribute. You see that Sahel had particularly beautiful skin, it was particularly desirable, um, and this was something that caused the admiration of this other companion. We also see that there is no evidence in this hadith that the issue here was one of jealousy. And this is a matter of disagreement amongst the scholars, as we said. But there is no evidence in my mind in this hadith that there is any inclination of jealousy. Rather, the Prophet ﷺ said, if you see something that you like, I something that amazes you and impresses you and you have a great deal of admiration for. 
We see the effect that it had upon Sahel. He dropped down to the point that he could not even raise his head. And that shows you the reality of Al Ain and the severity of Al Ain and the fact that it's not an easy issue, it's not a light issue. And a person perhaps could be killed by it. The Prophet said, Would one of you kill his brother? Why would one of you kill his brother? The next is I want you to notice the methodology of the Prophet ﷺ in dealing with Ain. What is his first point of call? Do you accuse anyone with regard to him? So our first point of call with regard to the cure for Ain is to ask ourselves, do we know or do we have a strong inkling of who it may be who gave the ayn. Who it may be that gave the ayn. So we see that, for example, there is a brother in a gathering and he comes out of the gathering and as he stands up to walk in front of the people, he drops down, uh, he begins to shake, he's very ill, you suspect ayn. There are a limited number of people in the room. And so you ask yourself, who do we suspect? Now this doesn't have to be certainty. And notice in the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ did not require a proof that was a certainty that he could instruct the people towards. Rather, it's enough for you to suspect a person. And in this suspicion, that person is then asked to perform ghusl or wudu. To wash themselves or to perform wudu. Ghusl or wudu. One or the other. Or to wash themselves in general and to collate the water. To collect the water that comes from this, uh, that comes from this ghusl or from this wudu. Now, in this regard, it is very important to note that if somebody comes and asks you to make ghusl, it is an obligation for you to do so. It's not for you to turn around and say, it wasn't me, how can you accuse me, I didn't do it, subhanallah, and so on and so forth. Okay, it's decided to restart. Oh, it did say to me four hours. So, with regard to this, that if somebody comes to ask you to perform uh, ghusl or to perform wudu, it's not for you to turn around and to say to them that it wasn't me and I didn't do it and why are you accusing me? Rather, you just simply say, of course, no problem. I don't think it was me, but no problem anyway. Bismillah. And there you go, you collect the water. Because at the end of the day, you don't know. Perhaps this person could be cured by simply a piece of water that they, or a small cup of water that they pour over their head. Instead of giving them months and months of difficulty and months of hardship, that they just pour the water over their head and they get up as though nothing was wrong with them. So we do, you know, we do emphasize this. That if a person comes, and sometimes it's a group, there were five people in the room and the brother was afflicted with ayn. If it was me, I would ask all five of them to make the wudu. I would ask all five of them and even though I, I, maybe I don't know exactly which one it is, but I will ask all five, it's a relatively small number and it's doable. However, there's no doubt there are times when you genuinely don't know. You suspect that a person is afflicted by the evil eye, but you genuinely don't have any real way of knowing who it was who gave it to them. And in this case, it joins together with jinn possession and together with magic in the sense of the cure being a ruqya shari'a, Islamic ruqya that is from the Book of Allah and from the Sunnah of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And it's this that I want to talk to you about. <coughs> so now we have three, or let's say that we have four problems. The first problem we have is we have somebody afflicted with jinn possession. Okay, either the jinn has fallen in love with them or they inadvertently harmed the jinn and they're suffering from jinn possession. The second case we have is we have somebody who has been afflicted by black magic. And I use the word black magic as a term only, otherwise all magic is black and all magic is 
evil and there is no such thing as white magic or good magic. The third case we have is somebody afflicted by the evil eye and they don't know who gave it to them. So there's no way to get the wudu water or the ghusl water. The fourth case we have is somebody who is simply sick and unwell. Medically they're not well. All of these four, the answer is to perform for them a ruqya. To perform for them ruqya. However, there are certain preconditions to the ruqya taking place. The most important of those, and again, I'm not going to talk in so much detail, and, and I have some of this on the website, but in a, in a sort of a brief sense, the most important precondition is the matter of the person's aqidah and the person's belief. And this applies to the one that is reading on them and the one that is being read upon. That both of them, their belief and their trust in Allah is corrected and that the person is a person who worships Allah Azza wa Jal alone. In reality, I cannot emphasize to you how important Tawheed is in Ruqya. In fact, Tawheed is everything in Ruqya. If you have it, your Ruqya will be successful even if you only read Qul Allahu Ahad. And if you're missing it, Wallah, you can read the Qur'an 20 times over and you will not make a blind bit of difference. You require that person to be someone who worships Allah Azza wa Jal alone and for you to be someone who does the same. And that you make the religion for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And in reality, you can see perhaps the evidence for this, or perhaps you can see an insight into this. If you look at the dua for protection, look at all the duas that you make in the morning and the night for protection. Almost all of them, if not all of them, relate to La ilaha illallah. Look at any of them. The du'as you make, this protects you, this saves you, this will protect you for the rest of the day, this will protect you for the shaitan in the night. All of them, if not, or the vast majority, are based upon la ilaha illallah. Because the greatest protection of any individual is their tawheed. And after their tawheed, their obedience to al-Aziz al-Hamid. Their obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their turning to Allah Azza wa Jal and their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these are fundamental parts of a person's or preconditions to a person's <laughs> ruqya so it's about the issue of taqwa your obedience to Allah and your avoiding disobedience to Allah. I remember doing Rukia on people. And the Rukia case is taking me two years. You know, two years I've been reading on them and it's going nowhere. You know, I mean, they're getting a little bit better, but I'm thinking, subhanAllah, I'm reading on them and, you know, everything's going, what is wrong here? And then we find out that there was something hidden, some form of disobedience, some major sin that was hidden under the carpet, and it surfaces by accident. The sister you're reading on has a boyfriend. She doesn't wear hijab when she's out of the house. We didn't, you don't know any of this. Because when you're reading on the person, you just see them, you know, and they're, they're fully covered, and you know, you're not looking at them, and everything is, you know, according to the conditions of Islam, and so on and so forth. And then you find out later on. As soon as that sister leaves that sin that she was doing, the cure happens. This has happened so many times to me in Rukia. The family have been saying, we've tried every Raqi. I will say to them, try every Raqi. Have you tried abandoning, disobeying Allah Azza wa Jal? You will find that there's nothing like it in Rukia. Abandon the disobedience of Allah and you will see how quick the cure of Allah Azza wa Jal comes. But as for the ones, and this is generally an almost solid rule, that every Rukia case that takes a long time, almost every case, something comes up after a week or two weeks or a month or two years, we find out there is some munkar, some evil going on in the house 
that the person is involved in or outside of the house which is causing the shaitan to have a hold of them. And I'll give you another evidence for this. With regard to the children, when we recite on children, we find the shaitan does not stay with them for a long time. In fact, the shaitan leaves them extremely quickly. And perhaps the person would like, you know, the child would have a problem for two weeks or three weeks. Or perhaps, you know, like this is an average. I mean, I've had longer, but most children very quick. Why they don't have any sin for the shaitan to hold on to, to feed off. Whereas the adults, we have that. And so turning to Allah, the prayer. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الصَّابِرِينَ All you who believe, seek the help of Allah through patience and the prayer. SubhanAllah, I can't, you know, underestimate the value, or I can't, you know, it's, it's impossible for me to, over, to, to exaggerate, sorry, the value of the prayer to the Rukia process. And again, people say, I read and I read and I read and I read and I read Al-Baqarah twice a day and I'm not getting any better. The prayer, the prayer, the prayer. Look at the prayer. Where do you pray? How do you pray? How often do you pray? What are the times like that you pray? And what is the situation like that you pray? And these are critical questions to the success of the Ruqya. Dua. And there is nothing quicker in solving the problems of the jinn and magic than du'a. In fact, du'a is quicker than ruqya. And that's not to say you use one to the exclusion of the other, but you raise your hands and if your du'a is accepted, your problem is gone. It's gone instantly. Nothing is difficult for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The du'a of Ayyub, the du'a of, uh, of, uh, of Yunus, the, the, you know, the du'as that relate to sickness, the du'as that relate to difficulty, the du'a that relates to pain. And, you know, for example, I mean, if you were to go on something like du'as.com, which is a decent website with some reliable du'as on it, du'as.com, you would find that there is a collection of du'as relating to sickness and pain and relating to difficulty and so on and so forth, that a person, if they were to say them in the times of acceptance, perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would remove this problem from them instantly. And Shaykh Adil Muqbil, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, he told us a story of a man who spoke with him. And Shaykh Adil, he has a, a methodology that he doesn't do ruqya. People come to him and he's very famous for his knowledge of magic and he's catching magicians, but he doesn't do ruqya. So they come to the Shaykh and they said, oh, you know, Shaykh, we have a problem, magic in the family, you know, will you do ruqya? And the Shaykh essentially said, these points that are mentioned on the, on, the, on, the, on the sheet here. Taqwa, prayer, dua, seeking forgiveness. He said, if these don't help you, by Allah, there's no raqi that can help you. So the man went away. And the man came back a week later or so, and he picked a big you know, handful of ta'weed, a big handful of magic, and put it on the desk of the sheikh. And the sheikh said, you've destroyed yourself. You know, you've been to a magician, and this, you, you know, you've, you, the, your magician will never bring success for you. He said, no, Sheikh, I did what you told me. And I made dua in the night. And I got up for tahajjud. And I corrected myself. And I sought Allah's forgiveness. And I prayed and I prayed. The first or after two nights or something, the phone rang. Said, go to your house outside. Look in a certain place. Dig it up. You'll find what you're looking for. Hang up. So I go outside. I dig. And I find a ta'weed that has been done, magic that's been done on me. But look at the methodology of this brother. He said, I carried on praying. I didn't stop. I carried on praying and making dua. The next night, the phone rang again. Look in this place here. He found the one that was done for his son or his wife. And the next night, another one. And I don't remember if he said two nights or three nights. But he came with his whole family. The phone calls of his whole family. And he brought the ta'weed that had been done, the magic that had been done, and it was destroyed by the Shaykh. And this is through what? Through taqwa, through prayer, through dua, through seeking forgiveness. Now I'm not saying these are used to the exclusion of ruqya, but I'm saying that if you're missing these, this is probably where your ruqya is going wrong. And you know the hadith of the man, 
Ash'atha Aghbar. He was covered in dust and he's disheveled. And he raises his hands to the sky and he says, Rabb, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabb, my Lord, my Lord. His, and his food is haram and his drink is haram and his clothing is haram and he's been nourished with haram. What did the Prophet ﷺ say about him? How is Allah going to answer him? How many people, they say, we've done ruqya, we've done, we've done, we've done, we've been to this guy. Uh, the imam has come, the imam of the Kaaba came and read, the imam, this famous person came and read, this person came and read. Nothing is happening. Say, look at your income. Is your income halal? Are you living in a house with a mortgage? How is Allah going to answer them? Allah Azza wa Jal is not going to answer, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may not answer you. Because of these things. So sometimes what my point is, is that many, many times, the problem is in the obedience to Allah and not in the ruqya. Next point, removing things that attract the shaitan. Wallahi, some people's houses are literally open to the shaitan. Like a banner hung on the roof, Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bish shaitan. Welcome, welcome shaitan. Come in, come inside. The music, the TV, the movies, the haram, the haram in every place, the free mixing, the uncovered people, the all of, you know, every kind of bab, min abwab al-haram, every kind of type of haram is present in the house. We say, subhanallah, how is this person bringing the shaitan into the house? And then they say, we do ruqya, we read al-baqarah. We say, remove the things that attract the shaitan. Remove the pictures, remove the photographs, remove the TV, remove the music, remove the free mixing, remove all of the haram that is going on. Integrate with what? Or add what? Add the prayer, add the dhikr, add the recitation of the Quran, add the beneficial knowledge. Inshallah, watch what it does. Because you are making, and this is the advice of our Shaykh Ali ibn Ghazi at Tuwajri, and I said to him about this, and he said, Make that house a place the shaitan hates to be. Make that house a place. It's full of dhikr. It's full of the names of Allah. It's full of good and it's full of uh, al-birr and it's full of taqwa and it's full of people remembering Allah and it's full of the things the shaitan hates. Could you bear to live in a place that had the smell of a sewer or a toilet? Could you bear to live in that place? You might live in it an hour or two hours. You couldn't bear it. It would drive you insane. Wallahi, the smell that comes from the good deeds that you do. For the shaitan is worse than that. That shaitan is going to leave. He's not going to be able to stay because that environment is an environment that's hostile to the shaitan. In terms of protecting yourself through dua and dhikr. Sorry. No, 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 no. Sorry to disturb the talk. Um, I've got one of the neighbors complaining because somebody's parked in this uh, car parking space. Um, it's a Ford Focus EF52 FDK. He's actually blocked that car in by his own car now because he's so annoyed. So whoever the car that is, can you please go out and sort it out? So, okay. so now we have the, the uh, issue of uh, protecting yourself through dua and through dhikr. Protecting yourself through dua and through dhikr. Now from this is the basmala. And I'm just giving you, I'm not giving you the only eight things here. I'm giving you eight, and these are on my website. I'm giving you eight simple, simple things that probably all of you already know. <coughs> the basmala, when you go in the house. Bismillah, when you go in the house. Bismillah, when you go out of the house. Bismillah, before you set foot. Bismillah, before you eat. The simple things. This blocks the shaitan from staying in your house. It blocks the shaitan from eating with you. And it blocks the shaitan from affecting you. The last three surahs of the Quran, Al-Ikhlas, Al-Falaq, and Al-Nas. Reading these surahs after every prayer, reading them three times in the morning after Fajr, three times in the evening after, after Maghrib, or some of the scholars say after Asr, and you're reading these simple surahs of the Quran. Protects you for the rest of the night. Protects you for the rest of the day. Ayatul Kursi, after every prayer. And you know the hadith regarding Ayatul Kursi after the prayer. That there is nothing between the person and between, pa uh, death, uh, between paradise except death. And the protection of Ayatul Kursi from the prayer to the prayer. 
The dua for entering the bathroom, the dua for leaving the house, the dua for setting foot in a new place. A'udhu bi kalimati lai tam mati min sharri ma khalaq. Bismillah alladhi la yadurru ma'a ismihi shay'un fil ardi wa la fi as-sama'i wa huwa as-sami'u al-'alim. La ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika la. Lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-hamd yuhyi wa yumit wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. Eight du'as that probably most of you know and if you don't know them none of them take longer than a line. I mean this is a PowerPoint presentation they barely take a line. Like on a line of paper one line maybe. One line a line and a half each. Each one of them is said to protect you against the shaitan for a long time or to protect you against the shaitan for the evening or protect you for against the shaitan in the morning or protect you until you return or protect you when you leave or protect your home or protect your family these are means of protection these are means for you to be protected and they're simple they're not difficult you can teach your children you know it's really important that you do this that your children learn to read ayat or kursi they learn to read al-falaq and al-nas before they get taught in the madrasa that they learn it for themselves to be able to protect themselves. And that you don't bring up your children to fear the shaitan. But you bring them up to fear Allah. And you teach them that if the shaitan gets you, the shaitan afflicts you, if you feel scared, just read Al-Falaq. Read An-Nas. Read A'udhu bi kalimati Allah tamati min sharri ma khalaq. I will tell you another video that I saw. And I know the shaykh won't thank me for telling you, but I'll tell you anyway. And that's because he, he refuses to give me the video, subhanAllah. So every now I tell him, if you refuse to give me the video, I'm going to tell people the story until you give me the video. Uh, one of the things that we saw from our Shaykh, uh, Adil Muqbil, Hafizullah Ta'ala, is that the Shaykh went to a place in, uh, I think it was uh, in Indonesia or Malaysia. And there was a wali there from the awliya, you know, one of these big holy men. And this holy man, his trial for the people, he stands in front of the people, he says, any of you try to kill me or harm me. They bring guns, they bring sticks, they bring knives, and they try to attack him. The knife goes like this, they just fall back flat on the floor. Because of his quote-unquote iman. His iman is so strong that uh, his iman repels them. And he has students who are doing the same thing. And they're all just worshipping the jinn and seeking help from the jinn. So in any case, he has his son is on a motorcycle. When he revs the motorcycle engine, everyone around like a wave flies back in the air. And this is all captured on video. Flies back in the air and lands. So he goes and the sheikh comes up in his usual way, you know, trots along with his shaman one and he, he says, I want to have a go. The guy said, you can't fight against the wali because his iman is too much for you. But we will give you the weakest of all of the students. This little boy. And the little boy is there flicking people in the sky and he's, you know, like throwing people around. He's like, go on, go on. And this guy's falling, these guys are falling over. So he goes up to the boy and they say, what do you want? There's a knife, there's a stick, there's, you know, all sorts of variety of weapons. Sheikh looks in and says, it's all right, I have a weapon. He said, no problem, whatever weapon you have, He's trained in repelling any weapon. So the Shaykh walks up to him and he says, A'udhu bi kalimati Allahi tammati min sharri ma khalaq. And the kid just goes, bang, flat on the floor. He just goes, and hits the floor. So the, the wali turns to him and says to him, I told you he's weak, he's my weakest student. She said, no problem, line up all of you. The wali and one by one by one. And he walks past going, and one by one, they just fall down like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> what is it that did that? Not the shaykh, he didn't do anything. The words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or the statement, the perfect, seeking refuge with the perfect words of Allah. Azawajal. One word, A'udhu bi kalimati Allahi tammati min sharri ma khalaq. Find a shaytan. Wallah, if you blew on Iblis, he would run. You could not bring a shaytan that can stand in front of the perfect words of Allah. And Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَلَوْ أَنَّ قُرْآنًا سُيِّرَتْ بِهِ الْجِبَالِ أَوْ قُطِّعَتْ بِهِ الْأَرْضِ أَوْ كُلِّمَ بِهِ الْمَوْتَى If there was a Qur'an that could reduce the mountains to dust or make the, earth, make the earth, render the earth asunder, break the earth into pieces or cause the dead to speak, it would be this Qur'an. 
This Qur'an, there is nothing that can stand in the way. But some people may say, yes, but I read the Qur'an and the shaitan is too strong. We say, no, it's not like this. First of all, go back to the original points. Are these there? If they are, then simply we say the ayah that Allah Azza wa Jal mentions. وَتِلْكَ الْأَيَّامِ نُدَاوِلُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ In these days, we give victory to one over the other. This was said about who? About the Prophet ﷺ and his enemies. If the Prophet ﷺ was made to wait well in excess of a decade before he was able to come back and to conquer Makkah, and he is the Prophet ﷺ, and with him is the angels and the help of Allah ﷺ, and yet he was made to wait. And why does Allah say? So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will know those who believe among you and will take from among you martyrs. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may delay his help for a time, but with patience and prayer, it will come. There is no problem with the Qur'an, there is no shaitan that can stand in the way of the Qur'an. One ayah, they could not stand in the way of it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to test you. Wants to test your iman and wants to test your patience and wants to forgive you your sins and wants to make it a release for you. How many people, myself, and I'm sure Brother Basak would agree with me in this, how many of us we've seen that these people were not practicing Islam until they started doing Rukyan. And then they started praying and now they read the Quran and they do all of their adhkar and they, you know, they, this is because they weren't even practicing Islam before. So this has been a blessing in disguise for them. There is no problem with the power of the Qur'an. There is not one shaitan can stand in the way. However, this is a matter of a test from Allah, and Allah will give sometimes you good days and bad days. Allah will give you days where He gives a degree of victory to them and a degree of victory to you to test you, how you're going to react and how you're going to behave. But otherwise, there is nothing that can stand in the way of this Qur'an. And how many people we see going left, right and center, from everything they can to seek a protection in something that has no protection for them. So you see them with the amulets wrapped around and you see them going to this guy and going to that guy and seeking help and protection. Honestly, their protection is in the ruqya and in the recitation of the Qur'an. Now I'm just going to give you now a simple ruqya. I'm not going to give you a complicated ruqya. Why? Because most of you may not know the ayat. And then you'll be sat flicking through the mushaf and trust me, when you've got a jinn in front of you or multiple jinn and things are going a bit crazy, the last thing you want to be doing is flicking through the mushaf. You want something that you know by heart and you're quite confident with. Otherwise, I've had times where I've got the mushaf in one hand and someone's trying to kick me in the other and, you know, they're jumping on top and, you know, Basak's got a hold of one arm and I've got a hold of the other and the mushaf's in one hand. It doesn't work as well. So we want something simple that you can easily do. What is Rukia? Rukia is an incantation or a recitation of, uh, in our case, the Qur'an and the authentic du'as from the Sunnah and the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, it has certain conditions. It must be in a clearly understood language. So no, none of this. It has to be clear and it has to be understood. It has to be with the Qur'an and the authentic du'a from the sunnah and from those things that, re- or the, that are attached to it like the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it uh, must be free of any association of partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A very simple ruqya that you can perform. And don't think this in simple means ineffective. Don't write, don't write instead of simple, ineffective. This is all that you need, inshallah. But if you do more, alhamdulillah. Surah Al-Fatiha. The Prophet ﷺ said, وَمَا أَدَرَاكَ أَنَّهَا رُقْيَةً What will make you know that it is a ruqya? Or what made you know that it is a ruqya? Surah Al-Fatiha is from the most powerful of ruqya. And you need to understand what it means. You need to understand what you are saying when you say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. This is a huge, the meanings within the whole of the Qur'an is contained within Surah Al-Fatiha.
to all of the meanings of Tawheed, the Tawheed al-Rububiyya, Tawheed al-Uluhiyya, Tawheed al-Asma al-Sifat, all of them are in Surah al-Fatiha. Seeking the help of Allah and Allah alone is in Surah al-Fatiha. And you will see what the words Iyaka na'budu wa Iyaka nasta'in do to the jinn. You can destroy a jinni with the words Iyaka na'budu wa Iyaka nasta'in. When you say to Allah Azza wa Jalla, it is you alone we worship and you alone we ask for help. Because why? Your protection is in your Tawheed. And in your worship of Allah Azza wa Jal. Ihdina sirat al mustaqeem Guide us to the straight path. Guide us to the path of those who Allah has blessed, of those who Allah has sent His blessings upon us, bestowed His grace upon. Ula'ika ma'al ladina an'am Allahu alayhim min al wa siddiqeen wa shuhada'i wa salihin wa hasuna ula'ika rafiqa. With the messengers and the truthful and the prophets, the martyrs and the righteous. And what an excellent group of companions they are. This is what a wonderful surah, you know, seeking refuge with Allah from knowing the truth and not acting upon it and from being ignorant of the truth in the first place. This is an incredibly powerful book. Ayatul Kursi, the greatest ayah in the book of Allah Azza wa Jal. That begins with the affirmation of Tawheed. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum. Repeated again and again. The last two ayat, and not surahs of Al-Baqarah. The last two ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah. That must have been written late at night. The last two ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah. Aman al-Rasul. The Prophet ﷺ said in some of the hadith that these ayat or a word to the effect of these ayat are enough for you. Whoever reads these, they will suffice him. Or as he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the last three surahs of the Quran. And how many people in Ruqya, they're reading as Safat and Yaseen and mashallah, tabarakallah, that's amazing. And they're missing al-falaq and al-nas. And this is a huge mistake. Al-falaq and al-nas are, the, are an asl in Ruqya. They're a fundamental principle in Ruqya that you stick with all the time. Al-Ikhlas, Al-Falaq, Al-Nas And Al-Kafirun if you want to add All of these are narrated In the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu For Ruqya With the exception of Aman al-Rasul And something is narrated similar That it will suffice you against every evil But in general all of these are narrated Within the Sunnah that the companions Did Ruqya with them And the Prophet Sallallahu did Ruqya with them And Ruqya was done on him with them With Al-Falaq and Al-Nas with Al-Falaq and Al-Nas. Everybody knows them. But instead we're waiting for this Raqi is going to come and he's going to read something really amazing that we don't know and then the jinn is going to leave. Al-Falaq and Al-Nas would be enough for you. What might happen? Sheikh Ali Tawajri, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, he said to me when I first began Ruqya, he said to me, Oh Muhammad, when you begin doing this, you're going to see the strangest of things. And there's no doubt that strange things might happen. But at the end of the day, your protection is with whom? With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not protection that you're going to seek. You know, you can't. The Raqi, in terms of their tawakkul, they should be higher than other people. Should be. Because this Raqi doesn't have anything physically he can protect himself against the jinn with. There's no sword, there's no shield, there's nothing I can hide behind. The only thing you have is your trust in Allah. The only thing you have is your recitation of the Qur'an. You find a sick person, read Al-Fatiha, Ayat Al-Kursi, Aman Al-Rasul. The last three surahs of the Qur'an, blow over them. Insha'Allah Ta'ala, you will find the effect will be extremely powerful. And continue and be patient in it. And Insha'Allah Ta'ala, you will see the, the, the benefit of that. The last point that I mentioned there is the seven-day program. And this is a program from our Shaykh Adil Muqbil, Hafidullah Ta'ala. And this program is uh, basically seven days uh, of using water and oil that have been recited upon, along with honey and black seed. The instructions are on my website, muhammadtim.com. And inshallah Ta'ala, if you are worried about someone, or if you're not sure what to do, or if you want to treat a patient, inshallah Ta'ala, it's beneficial to do this seven day program. Uh, and it involves rukia oil, rukia water, honey, 
black seeds, very, very, very simple, simple cures from the sunnah, you know, taking them. And in addition to this, we have cupping. This is also extremely beneficial for people afflicted with jinn and afflicted with uh, magic problems. And, you know, so on and so forth through the cures that are mentioned in the sunnah. One thing I will mention here, and I usually do, and I'm going to say this in conclusion because it is getting late, is to mention that with regard to the recitation or with regard to the cases that come of the sisters who you are not their mahram. And when you get involved in Ruqya, you see the majority of the cases of people who come to you are women. And we always emphasize to the brothers that there are certain things that everyone should be doing so that they don't fall into evil in this regard. First of all, the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal should be paramount. And it should go before everything. And it should be given more importance than everything. Secondly, sticking to the limits set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this regard. Meaning not being alone with a sister who is not your mahram. Uh, having her mahram with her at all times. Uh, you know, dealing with her in the best possible way. Lowering the gaze and so on and so forth. It's not allowed for a raqi to touch her. And he doesn't need to touch her. And those people who touch women in Rukia, I have no idea. I think this is a very weak opinion. And I know a lot of people do it, but it's a very weak opinion. There is no need for it, and there's no evidence for a need for it from the Sunnah. Rather, if you touch a person from the, the people you're allowed to touch, like chasing the jinn, you know, massaging the, the head and following them down, or putting your hand on their head, that's fine. But this is a sister who it's better for you to have an iron nail driven through you than it is for you to touch her. And the haram has not been made as a cure for this ummah. So we say that you don't touch her, you keep well away from her. My preferred technique, if I can borrow Abdurrahman for a minute, is to read from behind. Why? First of all, keep yourself an arm's length away. Second of all, by reading from behind, you don't get to look at her face and stare if she's not wearing niqab and this is better and safer for her and for you and you're further away from anything that might cause you some degree of haram now I'm not saying you never ever ever may be in a situation where you need to touch someone and the darura is a well known issue in Islam of necessity however necessity means necessity necessity doesn't mean oh she's sick bismillah that's not necessity necessity is in my opinion two main things she attacks you in which case you have to defend yourself. So she just goes for you, and I've had that happen a few times. Um, just like, you know, you see the anger boil up, and it's just like, rah, that's it. And they just jump up, and they just go for you. That's one time. And the second time is if she's about to self-harm. And I've had that as well. I'm going to smash a glass straight for the throat. I'm going to cut my throat. Or in that case, you, this is a necessity. You grab the hand, you know, you take it back. She's punching herself in the head. The mahram isn't able to cope. You know, you have to get involved and you have to help. But in general, your basic principle should be with regard to the ladies that you don't compromise in this. And the reason I say is, Wallah, you can't imagine how much the people who do Ruqya are compromising this. And how many people end up in illicit relationships or end up in whatever. Because why? He's been alone with a woman for the last four weeks, you know, three hours a day. Only her and him. And the shaitan is there already to start with. And the shaitan doesn't, you know, I mean, the shaitan's getting a helping hand in this regard. So we say to the brothers that if you do go on to do ruqya, or you do go on to do ruqya in your family, it may be such that you are the only person that can read on this woman, in which case stick to the limit set by Allah, have her mahram with her at all times. If you need to touch her, you have the mahram's hand that you can put on. Uh, otherwise, keep well away and don't give the shaitan an opportunity to ruin your good deeds that you're trying to get through your ruqya. And I, the reason I emphasize this is because it's very common. And you know, you do ruqya, you get a lot of cases of people. But if you stick to the limits set by Allah Azza wa Jal, I highly recommend having a ruqya partner. Why? A number of reasons. First of all, they remind you of Allah Azza wa Jal when you forget. And if you compromise yourself in something, they're there to say, Ittaqillah. They're there to help you if things get particularly physical. It doesn't, you know, usually it doesn't. But, you know, you get, like, we probably get 
one case in five, maybe, maybe one case in five, something like that, that gets a little bit physical. Having somebody on hand, and I'm not talking about really physical, but you know, having somebody on hand is good to help you control them in a safe way. Because you have to be safe. You have to bear in mind the patient's health above everything and safety. Doing ruqya in a place. Look, mashallah, this masjid is ideal in the sense that nice soft carpet, you know, there's nothing particularly sharp. There's, you know, it's, it's going to be difficult for them to run and grab something to cut themselves with or to cut you with. You know, so thinking about where you do the ruqya as well. Having a ruqya partner is extremely beneficial. They can take over when your throat becomes tired. They can give you some encouragement. And likewise, you work together. And also, it helps you from the point of if you're accused of anything. And this does happen. People get accused wrongly. The shaitan is involved. Or this guy did this. There's somebody with you who could say, no, this wasn't true, and so on and so forth. So my, my recommendation is very much so that when you do ruqya, have somebody with you who will help you, support you. Um, with regard to the sisters, uh, my personal advice is not to involve themselves in um, in being Iraqi in the, in the reality of the word, as in going from place to place and house to house and doing Rukia. But my advice is for them to get involved in Rukia in three situations. Number one, Rukia on themselves. Number two, Rukia on their close family members. Because this is different, you know, there's no issue of the woman becoming, you know, sort of maybe uncovered or... The, or an issue of the shaitan sort of getting to it. You know, she's in her own home. If her own son is afflicted or if her own, you know, husband is afflicted, then this is something where we need her involvement. And the third is to support the brothers who do ruqya. Wallah, we think this is the best way I've found, is to have a reliable sister there. She can take care of the lady's hijab. She can make sure that the lady is covered. She can look after her. She can manage the case for you so that you don't have to get involved. And again, the mahram is better, but sometimes you have, for example, a revert sister, she doesn't have a mahram, in which case what we would say to her is bring another sister who is reliable, and we will also bring a sister who will, inshallah, support you and be there. So there are plenty of people there, there's no chance of anything untoward happening, and your ruqya is not going to be wasted by the shaitan. During the ruqya, and this is the last point I'm going to make, you will have some disturbance from the shaitan, no doubt. The shaitan isn't going to just let you go. I mean, it's going to disturb you. But inshallah, it will never be more than a minor disturbance. Be idnillahi ta'ala. Now, the other benefit of the rukia partner is he's there to watch you in case it does become more than a minor disturbance. But you do get a minor disturbance. I mean, at the end of the day, Ibn Taymiyyah compared it to the greatest, or one of the greatest forms of jihad fi sabilillah. So at the end of the day, this is something which is needed and it is difficult and it has some comparisons to this you know this striving and making difficulty for yourself in the way of Allah Azza wa Jal, that you have you know an enemy of Allah in front of you who is trying to harm you you will have some irritation you know you might feel your face being scratched or you feel you know you you, you know you feel you can't recite or you feel your stomach tightening and none of this is you being possessed most of it is just a disturbance from the shaitan to get you to stop but once you get used to it, you realize that it just takes a blow or a recitation of ayat al kursi and it's gone. This is always going to happen. I even get it now when I give ruqya talks. Because there are people who come and they're afflicted. And the shaitan doesn't want you to talk about it. The shaitan doesn't want you to tell people how to get a cure with the permission of Allah. And so you get some adha, some you know, small harms, some little pains here and there, some sort of like uh, you know, uh, minor effects. This is something that you should embrace as part and parcel of the ruqya and not be worried about. If you get any, if you feel it's getting bad, simply apply the seven day program that is mentioned there from the website, put the oil on, and inshallah it'll all go away. Can it extend to the family? Sometimes, you know, every now and again, my Abdurrahman gets woken up at night uh, by them and things like that. And this, again, is just a way to get you to stop. It's a way to get the, the father to stop, you know, I'm going to bug your kids for a while. But at the end of the day, if the whole family is involved in recitation and doing the adhkar, inshallah, it's nothing lasting. It's just a matter of getting you to try to stop the ruqya. And at the end of the day, like I tell people, you don't see a tandoori chef without burn marks on his hand. This is the reality. The reality is if you're involved in a job day in, day out, you get some, you know, you're going to get some effect from it.
But bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, this will be a means for you to achieve something higher with Allah. And it brushes off very easily, nothing lasting, alhamdulillah. And you have that rukia partner there to keep an eye on you and make sure that, inshallah, if anything's getting worse or if he feels like you're getting too bad or it's getting more than just a small harm, then inshallah, he'll tell you, look, take a break, go do yourself your seven day program, do yourself some private rukia on yourself, you know, get yourself back, you know, fit and healthy, and then you can join back in again, inshallah. So, I haven't been able to obviously go over all of the points regarding Rukia, but uh, I've kept you guys for a very, very long time, and you've been incredibly patient. So, Jazakumullahu Khaira, and uh, Bi'idhnillahi Ta'ala, uh, the, the further resources for you, in terms of reading resources, I highly, highly recommend this book, which is Fath al Haq al Mubin, The Jinn, Magic, and Evil Eye. I really do recommend this book, and I think you'll find this book is essentially an expanding upon more or less what I've said today. So Fath al-Haq al mubin for a general person, it's excellent. As in, a general guide to Rukia, magic, the evil eye, it's all there for you. It's all there, you know, easy, within easy reach, bi ta'ala. Um, in terms of other resources, uh, two resources I'll give you, or, or one primary resource, go on the website, muhammadtim.com, there are articles, there are du'as, there, is, there are things to do with Rukia, there is Rukia audio, there are you know, YouTube videos. There's all sorts of things there to help you. Remember my aim or my perspective is to get as many people involved in this so that we can get rid of this problem by having lots of people who are able to deal with it rather than just having you know, sort of one person in an area or one person in a country or one person in a region who's able to do it. So my perspective is uh, to try to get as many people as possible involved in this, to try to help as many people as possible to help themselves and to help their families. And once again, I emphasize that helping yourself, reading on yourself and reading on your family is absolutely the best way to get a cure with the permission of Allah. And as for waiting for famous Raqi to come and read on you, this is rarely of, of any great benefit. There are benefits try this, try that, use this, use that but beyond that the, you need to put in the hours, you need to put in the time of the ruqya and do the recitation you'll see the barakah of the Quran in your lives, in your families and many many people change for the better so jazakumullahu khayran wa barakallahu feekum and uh, in terms of uh, questions inshallah I'm available to you guys but I think inshallah we, we probably won't keep you guys as a group any longer because I think I'm sure that uh, you know, you guys are, are, are going to be busy and we've got things to do tonight, inshallah. So we'll wrap it up there. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika shadu anna ilaha illa anna